Okay, so taking a step to the other side of the association equation, um, consideration a little bit for phenotype and exposure harmonization and standardization. So just a little bit of background. Um, recent genetic data has tended to have some level of harmonization or standardization. Um, as there are, there's been relatively limited number of platforms, uh, limited number of GWAS panels, exome chip, et cetera. That's that to some degree lim limits heterogeneity across the data. And the, the variable names tend to have standardized names, so RS numbers, chromosomal positions. Um, phenotype and exposure data, however, is individual to each study. So um, contributions to these differences are differences in questionnaires and data collection forms, um, variable names, measurement units for quantitative variables as well as definitions for um, qualitative. Uh, biomarker assays differ um, across studies and over time within studies. And some studies have begun began many years ago, so there are error effects, et cetera, and uh, just the data have been collected over through the large time span. So I believe our overall goal is to maximize the sample sizes of the phenotype and environmental exposure data for samples that have existing genetic data to increase statistical power to detect association. Uh, also, facilitating identification of variables that are needed by investigators utilizing data in dbGaP, as well as just reducing the duplication of data harmonization efforts. So in that, we want to basically maximize the utility of, a first step will be maximize the utility of the existing phenotype and exposure data. So usually um, the step for that is performing harmonization of a panel of phenotypes. Um, I think uh, there's probably a, a finite number of phenotypes and exposures um, that we could identify. It's, it's somewhat large, but not so large that it's not um, out of the realm of possibility, is to produce some set of, of phenotypes that we want to go and harmonize across all studies. And then ensure that all potential existing phenotypes and exposures that exist in the various studies are actually incorporated to dbGaP when possible. As there are, there are phenotypes, et cetera, in the studies that haven't actually been submitted to dbGaP that actually could be um, if, uh, if some effort were taken. Also, obtain new phenotypes and exposures on existing study participants with genetic data. So that means going back to the existing participants and getting additional data. And then for new projects, encouraging the use of standardized phenotype and exposure measurements. So this would be going forward um, for future studies, but obviously that effort would really pay off in terms of um, both uh, being, you know, uh, reducing the need to harmonize phenotypes in the future as well as uh, being able to um, identify people with um, specific phenotypes that you can then go, go in and genotype for studies. So, um, Phenotypes in dbGaP. There are often many variables for a given phenotype for a given study when a basic search is done. And there are lots of reasons for this. Um, multiple visits within a study, sub-cohorts within a study, for example, Framingham, um, and different definitions. Um, there'll be multiple variables for different definitions. Um, the, the variables and definitions may have different keywords to indicate them, so if you do a very simple search, for example, if you're looking for hypertension, um, some of the variables may be under high blood pressure, some may be uh, uh, you know, shortened or just partial words, and, uh, et cetera, so it's, it's not always a simple search. Um, and then there's varying levels of documentation submitted to dbGaP. So there tends to be documentation submitted with the variables, but it can vary widely across study and again within study. Um, sometimes ancillary study variables 
don't tend to be as well documented as original study variables. And then finding the additional documentation when there isn't enough uh, to make informed decisions is not always readily available. So just an, as an example um, for some of the, the, the NHLBI HeartGo cohorts, um, utilizing care data to go through phenotype uh, harmonization, start out with, there's a total of 55,000 variables that are in the care data sets. So um, breaking down by six days, you can see there's a variability in how many variables there are with Framingham is over 20,000. So um, um, it, as part of that process, as part of ESP, we've worked um, to try to create a set of harmonized uh, phenotype and exposure uh, data across approximately 140 variables where it's harmonized to, to, as, as, to the degree possible for these cohorts as well as uh, Women's Health Initiative. And um, we came up with composite names for them, such as BMI at baseline, current smoker at baseline, and um, there is documentation uh, that maps to the original study variables. But this is so that investigators within the study can um, not have to each pour through multiple variable names. So the process of phenotype harmonization is multi-step and it's iterative. Usually um, in, in consortia efforts, it's started by um, where there's a point person or a working group where they work with um, phenotype specific working groups or project teams as well as um, experts um, on the disease or trait. And then usually there's a first process where you scan through all the variables. So you start out with the 55,000 and you try to whittle that down. So for each phenotypic category, you try to collect all the variables that are related to, um, to your category of interest. And then um, you go back to the working group and the experts and you try to hone in on a common definition that, um, that you can reach across all the studies and that will address the scientific question of interest. And throughout the process, um, there's, there's lots of uh, things that you have to look into and consider, including sample size, measurement units, distribution of the trait, um, assay information, what visit it came from, et cetera. So I, I, you probably can't really see this, but I just very quickly wanted to give people an idea of what you're faced when, when you start to do these variable searches. So this is, this is asthma in Framingham, and this is actually only two of the three um, uh, sub-cohorts. So there's a lot more, um, and there's probably even more within the study itself. but. Um, obviously, uh, uh, somebody going to dbGaP and just, you know, may want to say, I want to look at asthma, they can look at that and it's not straightforward how to incorporate it and pick which variables to use um, and even how to decide, you know, what variables are for subcohorts, et cetera. And this is the listing um, just to show you hypertension, just to show you that it, um, it, it, this is across several different studies, but just to show that, um, you know, you would have to search under hypertension, high blood pressure, HTN, et cetera, and that it's not always clear what the definition was used um, for each one. Some of them will say definition four and five, and where, how do you find out what definition four and five is? And again, some of the documentation is there. Sometimes you have to search for it. Sometimes you need to go back to um, original study websites. But again, it can be a lot of work and a lot of people just don't know where to start. And this is just a, um, I, I wanted to mention medications. Medications is um, a whole new level because obviously I think medication by variant interactions are gonna be <clears throat> of interest. Excuse me. But um, this was a, you know, just looking for um, hypertension medication status. Some of, some of the variables are more um, overall composite measures of any hypertension medication. Some of them are, are listed out more specifically. Um, and uh, uh, there, there are medi the medications change over time, so it can depend on what visit. And then some of the studies actually have databases where they, they use codes and um, 
I, I didn't list those variables here, but that's the way to get to the medication um, information in some of the studies. <clears throat> Challenges of retrospective harmonization include that it's time consuming, <clears throat> obviously, um, that, that there's always gonna be differing levels of ability to harmonize across the studies. There's some things that um, you really can't harmonize very well. Um, inconsistent, inconsistent measuring units and our definitions, um, sometimes actually even within study across visit, but um, we've also run into changing units within a single variable. So again, um, uh, you know, you, you, you have to really look at the, the distributions. Uh, and sometimes there's not enough documentation to figure things out. So um, in the process that, that I've been working on with several others, there's a lot of going back to representatives of the cohorts and asking questions and sometimes asking multiple questions. And also, the impact of medications is a big challenge because lipids measured in people 20 years ago versus lipids measured very recently, um, you may adjust for a lipid medication uh, status, but uh, the, the kinds of adjustments that you would apply for a recent, a more recent, which is probably a modern statin versus years ago could be very different. So, um, Another issue is that data that's submitted to dbGaP is often limit, limited to the primary study variables. Um, what we've seen is that um, a number of times there may be additional um, phenotypes or exposures that were measured in ancillary studies, uh, but, but the investigators aren't aware of the genetic data being in dbGaP, and um, there, there's not necessarily uh, a mandate. They don't have to submit it. But a lot of times, if you go to them and ask them, they will. So um, sometimes additional visits, just making sure that additional visit um, information is incorporated as soon as possible. And then um, as a set of recommendations that I, I think most people would agree with is that there's a need to develop a panel um, of, of some number of harmonized phenotypes um, that have common variable names, common units of measurement and definitions. And uh, as well as, as um, some revisitation, potentially of the documentation that's currently in dbGaP, making sure every single variable has a definition, um, every single variable has um, visit information or sub-cohort information very specifically, and um, uh, and, and also flags or notes for special issues. Um, there are some variables that are, that are studies that are put in dbGaP, and then when we go to analyze them, an investigator will say, oh, you don't want to use that. That's, that's not a good variable. So there's no note there that will tell people that. So uh, one thing that we feel would be um, beneficial is to identify a point person or committee that could work within dbGaP to respond to questions from studies about the process of, of going back and providing some additional information and or helping to standardize um, variables. And that person needs to ensure that the studies are providing information in the same way. Even when we ask for standardized measures and consortia efforts, you'll, you'll think that you've got every um, detail listed in your documentation but you'll still get differences back. So there needs to be a process where when people have questions or something comes back in a slightly different way that um, you can follow up on it. And then um, it, it, it seems critical to obtain input from phenotypic experts and from representatives from the cohorts um, in order to identify um, composite variables or standardized variables. So um, another level, of course, is gaining additional phenotypes from existing studies. And um, uh, I, I think I actually mentioned this already, but in terms of the um, going to uh, ancillary studies or study that, um, sub-studies of the main study that may have not submitted data or additional visits, obvious pros are that it's relatively cheap and fast because it's already existing. Um, it just takes going and asking some of these and looking into it. Um, cons are, it tends to be a lot of these variables are only on subsets of the total sample um, and, and obviously not standardized across studies. 
So prospective um, collection of new phenotypes on existing studies um, also definitely have the place. Um, before that would be done, um, ideally you would, you would get a standardized um, set of phenotypes defined. Uh, so a big pro to this is that you can get input on this panel before you actually collect the data. Cons is obviously that it requires an additional visit or visits, um, which in turn um, require resources, um, as well as consideration of the burden on participants. So there are LC issues there involved. So um, in general, um, there's been a number of efforts that have addressed harmonization and standardization um, issues and um, when possible, I think we should leverage off those. Um, efforts include a number of consortia, including Geneva, CARE, CHARGE, ESP, and others. Um, there's NHL VIP Finder, which is, um, is a study where um, phenotype harmonization tools are being developed, as well as existing standardized, uh, variable standardization efforts, including the Phoenix toolkit, and um, I've, I've heard some really interesting um, work being done by NIA where they're developing a panel of standardized measures that they're hoping um, a, a set of measures that they want to identify that could be measured in an additional one-hour visit that, that, that um, you could revisit existing cohorts um, and get a, you know, a panel of measures in a relatively limited amount of time. So this is open for discussion. Yes. Uh, just as a, a point of interest, how many person hours did it take to go from the 55,000 Basically, terms? I haven't slept for the last three years. But. <laughs> so one, three, three person years. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, there's it's more just people. just you? There's many no, how many more. No, there's yeah. many more people. No, I'm actually looking for, uh, you know, so when we start talking about doing this across all of DBGAP, what, yeah. how, how big a team is it to, to, to Wait, and, and I, how, I how many it, volunteers are needed to do that? It, it yeah. looks, uh, you know, what I was showing is Framingham, which no offense to, to Chris and others from Framingham, but that's about a worst case scenario there. It, it gets much better for a lot, it's a, a it's lot of studies. It's Arm the Armageddon of harmonization. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, I do think it's it's relatively feasible. I think if you get um, if you have interaction with the cohorts and there's active effort to do this, I, I feel like there needs to be some support for the cohorts because when I go to them, you know, it takes time for them to do this to to provide the information, and they know the the variables far better than I ever will. Um, but, you know, again, it's going to take some level of, of resources to, to provide effort. But I do think it's doable to come up with some panel of maybe 100 to 200 measures and harmonize them across dbGaP. I think it's reasonable. Yes. So I'm just wondering, you know, as uh, in trying to consider various kinds of studies, uh, you're trying to harmonize uh, studies, essentially cohort studies, that all started with a single each study began with a single protocol that was discussed right. and planned. If one just goes into other kinds of data, for example, medical record data from which we're trying to extract, mm. do you have any sense as to how well they can be harmonized? I know everybody believes in the magical quality of EMRs, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. Except for anyone who's actually ever... Have read one. Yeah. And so... Do you, yeah, again, my, my, you? my focus has been on, you know, these cohort and case control studies. I, I haven't worked as much with the, the medical, but, but that's a great question is how much um, resources do we, you know, do we feel that there's a payoff there and we need to consider it. Or you'd have to phenotype, meaning yeah. for a while, phenotype individuals to get the kind of research right. questions. Right. David? Yeah. So, I was struck that, uh, two, two things. One is a question. So can we assume since CARE invested many years in doing this for, the, for a set of 50,000 people and now ESP led, and you've led both of these and done a spectacular job, that for at least those 50,000 people there, are, there is a file now. So it doesn't need to be done. It has been done. I, I think that's largely true. It is now pretty much collected and, 
you know, again, a lot of these efforts are yeah. duplicated. You know, Charge has done a lot of this, and a lot well, so, of that went into care. And so that's sort of so one point is just that the nation has invested a lot of money between care and Charge and ESP in doing this. So and so hopefully we have a good foundation where it could be uploaded immediately. Yeah, it's just a matter. Done. What I think right. was missing is just documentation that sure. can be gathered together, and so, that's what I've been trying to pull so the, together. So the other question I noticed in in, in genomics, I, I realize this is not how the culture and community works, but I'm going to be provocative like Eric said he was going to be provocative. What you described as an extremely labor-intensive and sort of meeting-intensive process, talked about a lot of input and discussion. Yeah. Aren't there any software solutions? Like, to be honest, as we've been involved, not in these cohorts, but in others, there's a set of moves that are routinely made. Yeah. And, and uh, we are actually trying for some other studies to actually automate them because yeah. and say, how, not that it would make it, not that you wouldn't need input, not that you would need consultation, but there's some amount of stuff that in the same way that everyone's calling their genotypes alone and then not putting sure. them together. And again, I'm not saying we should standardize as a nation, that's a committee process, but couldn't there be efficient software that if, some, that if there was a team that would have to have some number of people for some number of years, that mm -hmm. they wouldn't be doing it in the same handcrafted, meeting-driven way, but they right. might be more efficient? Right, I mean, there is, um, the PFinder study, which the goal of that is actually to develop software to do this. I'm actually involved in one of them. And it, it's interesting, they're using kind of smart searches, um, et cetera, um, uh, machine learning, et cetera, to, to, do, to try to automate some of this. And it's, it is very interesting, but, you know, just from my perspective, I don't think you're ever gonna, I, I feel like there still needs to be, at least now, there needs to be input from the investigators because the information that you're getting from there just isn't all there right now. Yes? Yeah, if I could maybe maybe speak to both Aravinda's and David's questions yeah. in terms of, of electronic medical records. There, there are algorithms, electronic algorithms, that can be developed to do this and tested, and it takes about one year to do that of maybe mm -hmm. two people in groups that are, are assessed you know, by uh, predictive value comparing to a gold standard of a clinician reviewing them. But having said that, that same process could conceivably be applied to some of these cohort data. Um, and, and I think that hasn't been tried yet in, in a project like Emerge. One of the challenges with it is that you end up with a bunch of people that you're really quite confident are cases, a bunch that you're quite confident are control, and, and a lot in between that you can't classify. And that's not what you want in cohort studies. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm curious, and maybe I missed it, do, do you talk to the P3G guys in this data shaper world and these epidemiologists who hang out together in that kind of zone? Because it's a very similar task that they've set themselves about harmonizing Across hmm. observational studies, have you ever I haven't. Come across, you haven't come across these guys. I haven't, but okay. Sounds like I need to, or so people need to. I mean, to. They, 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 they've taken on precisely the same task, mm, as it were, for, across epidemiological groups. Phoenix is talking to them, Ewan. Yeah, I was just um, going to say the the Phoenix Toolkit, which has about 350 standard measures and an online resource, more for moving forward with. Um, adding standard measures to new studies, but we've been <clears throat> working with P3G for some time and have mapped the Phoenix measures to the P3G variables, and, and you're right, P3G is used more for harmonizing data in existing studies and, and biobanks. Yes. Uh, is there a plan to deposit all these mappings back into dbGaP so everyone can just get them instead of reproducing so them? So that's largely what, what I've been trying to do is just collect the efforts that, that the people in the cohorts have, have been doing in their discussions during these, you know, other consortia and, and through the ones we're working on now and, and trying to just compile it all together with the goal of depositing it. I have, you know, I, I need to work with people at dbGaP or figuring out how to deposit it or in what um, manner. It's not... It's not there now, but um, well, we'd I be happy to work with you the instant you're ready to give it back. Okay, great. I, I would like to talk to somebody of you know what would be the best way to, well, to done, get this information in. Yeah, there. we've done quite a bit of work with the Phoenix group, yeah. trying to do some remapping back on to dbGaP and uh, anyone else like yourself who's done it. Um, there is a way to put it back in and to make it visible to people and credit great. you for it. Great. Uh, it's just it's the number of people that have actually done this is rare. It's yeah. a small number. Great. Yes. 
So I, I think that really what would be very important is to make sure that going forward, we have standards and harmonized standards which we can use very easily, right? So to have a software solution to reflect back to that question where you have all these variables and you can pick and choose those variables when you design your study would be really a good step forward. The mess what we have already in the past, it's not that easy to solve, but maybe going forward, this group can. Yeah, I mean, I focused a little more change. on the harmonization um, because it seemed like that, that was a little more of the focus of today, but standardization and moving forward is absolutely critical. I mean, it's, it's going to make things much more feasible as we move forward. Yes? Um, given the fact that electronic medical records are really um, the primary users seem to be the payers. Is there any activity among the payers to try to demand more uniform phenotyping? So, I mean, I'm just wondering if that would be a yeah, good I'm coalition. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but maybe somebody else knows. Yes? Yeah, I was thinking along the same lines, because if you're incorporating EHR in the future, as well as cohort studies, have you thought of using OMOP or similar uh, models for this mapping, or, or you are creating another one? <laughs> so um, again, I'm not familiar with that, and maybe I've missed, you know, at least in the efforts that we've done in ESP, CARE, et cetera, we've, you know, maybe something that we've missed and duplicated. Mm -hmm. But I, there needs to be a way to, I guess, you know, make, make sure people are aware of this. I'll have to find out what that is from you. Yes. So I was just going to make a quick comment in response to the payers question. Yeah. Um, so the, the answer is that the payers are not requesting this for the most part. And in the eMERGE network, we actually have done some work to try to harmonize um, the languages used in electronic medical record systems to four cross-institutional studies, and one of the things that we came across was that the same phenotype was being specified in different ways at different institutions, mainly because of business processes. And <coughs> this was, this, this does not change the, the payer's interest, because for, from their perspective, um, the phenotypes were sufficiently related that they were still paying for the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. so, so from their perspective, they're not really trying to force us to standardize it, because they recognize that business processes are different from one institution to another. Interesting. So, Can Eric, I, I know you had a comment before. I, I want an opinion from my cohort. <laughs> no, no, I have the same comment. Okay. Is that it? Very good. Thank you. Thank you.